According to Willie Brown, who's the mayor of San Francisco, we're never going to solve world peace if we can't even figure out what to do with our garbage. Uh, I put that quote here uh, just to kind of get us thinking about um, challenges, uh, challenges that we have, especially when it comes to uh, producing things like waste and whether that be, uh, you know, natural waste due to, uh, you know, things that we do that are biological processes or whether it is artificial waste, whether it comes from things like um, uh, manufacturing, food production, agricultural, livestock raising, or even things a bit more um, dangerous like nuclear waste, uh, we as a, as a population have to kind of figure out what do we do with our waste and how do we keep in mind sustainability as we figure out uh, ways to dispose of our waste. So we're going to talk about the different types of waste today and then also go through the different concepts about what we can do with it in order to create kind of a sustainable plan for uh, you know the fact that populations are getting bigger waste production therefore will be getting bigger uh, over the years and then therefore how do we deal with that increase in waste products so we're going to look first of all at municipal solid waste we'll also talk about um, liquid waste sewage treatment and then last i'll focus on radioactive waste um, but for the first thing i want to talk about is kind of municipal solid waste and the the different types of uh, waste production that uh, as a community, you know, uh, certain uh, US populations produce. So here, MSW, remember, is municipal solid waste. <clears throat> and on average, uh, every person in the US generates about four and a half pounds of municipal solid waste per day. So you'll notice over here on the graph, it's showing from generally 1960 on the left up to about 2013. Here's the total municipal solid waste produced in the US, and then here's the total average municipal solid waste per person generated over that same time period. And you'll notice that in about 1960, each person was generating just under three pounds of municipal solid waste. And then as we got into the 1990s and later, we're kind of averaging now kind of a little bit over four to four and a half pounds per day per person you may be thinking well surely we've cut that back because of recycling well only uh, about one and a half pounds of solid waste per day per person is currently being recycled uh, total municipal solid waste recycling here is in the blue so we do see that in the same time period we are recycling more um, than we were in 1960 but it's only about about one and a half pounds of that municipal solid waste per person per day if you think about how much waste then you uh, produce in a day, an individual producing about four and a half pounds per day in a year makes enough trash about equivalent to one cow. And if we have cows in our backyard and I assure you they are actually quite big. <laughs> the uh, equivalent of the height of that trash pile that we produce every year is about the size of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. If you are a family of four, uh, you make about uh, 6,300 pounds of trash. That's equivalent to the weight of an elephant and the uh, height of the Golden Gate Bridge. And if you think of a country, right, how much the US, for example, produces 254 million tons of trash. Remember, that's just in one year. And that's equivalent to about the weight of a blue whale or maybe 1.2 million blue whales. <laughs> Uh, and that's enough trash to reach to the moon and back 25 times. So just kind of putting some of this in perspective uh, about how much trash you generate per day, per year, uh, and then also to think on a large scale of what do we do with almost 700,000 tons of trash as a country like the U.S. So if we break down kind of municipal solid waste, <clears throat> we generate about 4 billion tons of municipal, agricultural, industrial, and mining solid waste each year. So municipal weight, right? So the municipal solid weight that we're talking about is a small fraction of the solid waste that, the waste that we make. We do make a lot of other waste from things like crops, right? Growing animals for livestock, mineral extraction and processing, that's for say manufacturing and whatever. 
And then of course, industries as well do have their own amount of waste. Municipal solid waste though, even though it's only about 5% of the solid waste that we produce, we spend a lot of time talking about this because it's concentrated in the cities. Like this is what you see. And this is what you are constantly, you know, dragging to the, the curb every Thursday when your trash gets picked up. It's also what makes it into our landfills. And so it's kind of the one thing, despite all these other types of solid waste, the municipal solid waste is the stuff that's most visible. And I think it's the most familiar to everybody, at least in this class. So of that municipal solid waste, so of the 5% that we were showing on the previous, of all municipal solid waste, this is kind of what the solid waste breaks down into. Notice that quite a bit of it is actually paper. Probably those numbers will be going down as we get more and more um, uh, 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 processes in place to recycle more and more paper. Notice too, you can reduce your municipal solid waste by recycling glass, metal, plastic as well. Of the other types of um, waste, solid waste that are in the municipal solid waste, food makes up a, quite a bit of that, yard trimmings, wood, and then other things like rubber, leather, and textiles. Now, this other category up here, about 3.3%, are things that are like cleaning agents, disinfectants, insecticides, repellents, and also something that is relatively new in the last say, maybe decade or so, something called e-waste. So e-waste is about 2% of this other category. And e-waste is stuff like computers, tablets, cell phones, all those things that we do and maybe not use anymore, pagers, whatever else, but that have a lot of precious metals in them and highly corrosive toxins. And we do have to figure out what to do with all of those. So what do we do with this municipal solid waste? And so MSWD, municipal solid waste disposal. So now we have to talk about the disposal of all of this waste. What do we do with it? Where do we put it? Well, in previous decades, we used to use a lot of open dumping um, situations. This is an example here in Illinois of what an open dump looks like. Here's another one in the Philippines. When I used to live in central Pennsylvania and I was teaching at a, a tiny college called Bucknell, that was in the central part of coal country in um, central Pennsylvania. And what happened is that when they would go into these um, valleys <clears throat> and mine out all the coal, they would now have this big open valley that had no coal anymore and they didn't know what to do with the valleys. They couldn't really build in it. It wasn't really useful for much. So what they would tend to do is use them for essentially open dumps. They are low effort and they are low cost. So literally, uh, you just had a big hole in the ground or a natural valley and you just dumped all your trash into that open hole. About 40 years ago, 75% of landfills were considered these open dumps. And so, you know, it, it's easy, right? Low effort, it's certainly low cost but people were throwing everything in there. Notice there's tires that looks like a refrigerator, maybe even a water heater, something like that, plus all the plastic and the trash. So the pros, sure, it's low effort, it's low cost. The problems associated with this, very unsightly, extremely unsanitary. You can imagine all the like, you know, critters living in there and all the stuff that is essentially leaching out of all of that. The other problem with open dumps like this, and as you can see here, this is a good example, all of the plastics, the vinyls, all of the things that are essentially made of volatile organic compounds, VOCs, um, are breaking down. They're breaking down over time. They're breaking down in UV light, and they're giving off gases, some of which, like methane, are flammable. So there is a huge fire hazard associated with these open dumps. So that's a big problem, right? When you have an open dump like this, if it catches fire, you have a big problem. So um, there is a fire hazard associated with that. And then they also, as they break down over time, as this trash starts to decompose, it creates this, um, I don't know what you'd call it other than like, you know, garbage sludge, this kind of, you know, leachate. If you leave your trash in the trash can for you know a week or so and it's nice and hot outside and you pick up the bag out of the trash can, you notice that there's like usually this little 
uh, you know, kind of watery fluid in the bottom of the bag, that is what's called leachate. That is what happens when all of the food waste and the plastics and the cardboards and the whatever else start to break down. It creates this liquid called leachate and that leachate, of course, underneath an open dump can get down into the bedrock. And the worst thing, of course, is what happens when it gets into the groundwater. You can easily contaminate your groundwater with this kind of garbage leachate, the sludge, if it actually then gets into the bedrock and gets into the local water supply. So open dumps used to be very popular, not so much anymore, um, because we now realize that there are quite a few problems associated with open dumps. So where is a good place to put an open dump or where is a good place to store waste? What are the considerations that we need to make before we locate some sort of a dump site? Contamination of the leachate is the biggest problem, right? Remember, we are if we're going to put a big pile of trash, we need to make sure that we are not going to put an open dump anywhere where that leachate can get into the groundwater. So the first thing we want to look at up here is we don't want anything that will directly contaminate the groundwater. So if we put an open dump in an area where the water table is really high, yet that leachate is going to get right into the groundwater and you're going to get direct contamination, right? So that's a big problem. We certainly don't want a situation like this. Remember too that since leachate is liquid, it will run downhill. So if you put an open dump on a slope and the leachate starts to run downhill to an area where groundwater is being recharged, for example, by a stream, this is also a very bad situation here, right? You'll get the, um, the stream contaminated with leachate, and then because that stream is considered a losing stream, right, meaning it is actually feeding the groundwater, we have a problem. The last situation here, right, we've got an idea of where we've got an open dump once again here. The um, groundwater table is relatively low in this example, but what we've done is we've essentially not lined the bottom part of our open dump. If we don't have a liner, something that's impermeable beneath that open dump, even though the water table is relatively low, over enough time, that leachate is going to eventually make it into the groundwater and will contaminate things. So even if you have a location where you feel there's enough room between the dump and the groundwater, if you don't put a liner in it, you're going to have very bad situations. You also don't want to have a situation where if you do have a liner, right, so now we got smart, here's our dump, and we made a liner underneath it. So that liner is now impermeable. That's a good thing, right? It keeps the leachate from getting directly into the groundwater beneath it. The problem, though, is that if you then build up enough of the leachate behind this impermeable boundary, this impermeable liner, what can happen is you can create something called the bathtub effect. You've now used the liner, but you've created so much leachate that the leachate eventually overtops the liner and flows downhill and can once again contaminate your groundwater. So you got to be really careful when we decide to pick places for our waste disposal. And even if you use the proper um, the proper situation, right, if you're using an impermeable liner, you've got to be careful that you don't have a situation where the accumulated leachate tops over your liner. So we kind of got away from the idea of open dumps and are now using something that's a bit more um, a bit more usable, something called a sanitary landfill. So what's the difference? Remember, an open dump is just a hole in the ground that you throw your trash into. A sanitary landfill uses a similar principle, right? You're going to find either a natural valley or maybe a gravel pit or an, ab an abandoned mine, and you are going to input your trash into that open um, uh, system daily. However, the first thing that we're going to do differently is that we're going to put a liner underneath the sanitary landfill. So the bottom part, right, is going to be impermeable. We're then going to add our trash into that every day. So we're going to have our trash. 
But then what we're also going to do on top of that now is every day that we put our trash in, we're then going to cover that trash with dirt at least once a day. Sometimes they'll do it even more. The dirt is really important. The dirt will help to keep the smell down. It helps to keep critters out of it, right? You'll keep rats and seagulls and whatever else out of it. And it also kind of just creates a barrier uh, on top of the trash uh, to kind of keep it protected from the elements or whatever else. So it's not getting direct UV radiation. It's not getting direct rainfall. The next day, right, you'll come and you'll bring in more trash and you'll pile your trash up here and then you'll cover it with dirt again. And this happens over and over and over again. And I'll show you a, a kind of a, a, a schematic diagram of a sanitary landfill on the next slide. They're actually very sophisticated. Once the landfill is full, what they do is they actually kind of cover the whole system with dirt and they usually repurpose it. Things like parks or pastures, parking lots. There's actually a ski area in Illinois that they've now named Mount Trashmore, <laughs> or they'll put a golf course or something on it. And again, you know, these are kind of low stakes. There's nothing that's really going to get hurt by the landfill underneath it. Um, it's just a place to repurpose, a, a way to repurpose the area that now has all that trash underneath it. So a, a sanitary landfill is a very sophisticated situation. The, the location where you put it actually first has to have low enough groundwater, right? So we've got to have our groundwater pretty low, but we're going to make sure that we put in wells to monitor not only the soil, but also the groundwater to make sure that we never have any sort of contamination. Here's another groundwater monitoring well over here that is on the other side of the um, sanitary landfill. Here's the idea. The first thing that we want to look at is we're going to create a barrier system, right? So this is where you would put kind of your impermeable liner. And believe it or not, the impermeable liner is not just one little thin piece of liner. It's actually a multi-phase system uh, using all sorts of like geomembranes and all sorts of crazy uh, newfangled textiles that are trying to keep the waste in and to keep it from getting into the groundwater. The next thing you have on top of the barrier system is you've got kind of this permeable uh, sy system right here that is the leachate collection system. It's kind of like a French drain, right? It's gravel where you can actually collect any leachate that is coming from the waste will get into this kind of French drain system and can then actually be monitored or pumped out if it's getting too high. So you won't get the bathtub effect here because we're able to collect the leachate. The waste is then piled into the landfill every day on some of these little benches here, and then it's covered right every day with its dirt. Um, and on top of it too, then once we start to fill up the landfill, you're gonna put a covering over top of it, right? A, these uh, geomembranes, clay with vegetation, all sorts of stuff there. And so that you don't build up a problem with things like methane gas building up or whatever, you're also then going to put in vents to let the methane gas escape here so that you don't have a fire risk. Pretty sophisticated. There's even a stormwater control system so that if you get a ton of rainwater or flooding from storms, it won't affect any of the waste from getting out of the landfill. So pretty sophisticated stuff, lots of things and way more advanced than just let's find a hole in the ground and let's put all of our trash in it. So sanitary landfills work pretty well, right? And so if you look at here, here's a, a, a kind of a time lapse uh, of the U.S. And this is showing you uh, landfills in the U.S. Red is open green is closed and the size of the dot of course is how much trash is being collected there there's 2000 and getting up into 2013 before it starts back at the early 1900s so you can see that actually as the population has increased significantly across the u.s over time we've had more and more trash that we've had to deal with. And so the number of open landfills that we need has increased uh, significantly, quite a bit in the Midwest and Florida, 
Of course, Southern California, highly populous areas as well, not so much in the Southwest or, um, or the kind of the Montana, Colorado, Idaho area, but of course then that's where the population is significantly lower as well. Landfills are kind of becoming short. Uh, we don't really have uh, a lot of landfill space left. And of course, there's a lot of people who are saying, I don't want it in my backyard, so you have to find someplace else for your waste. So I kind of want to look at four what I'll call responses to landfill shortages. What can we do with our trash rather than putting it into a landfill? What are other ways we can deal with our trash or deal with it in, in part so that the amount that goes to the landfill is significantly lower? Lots of people suggest that, well, we should just burn it. So we can have number one that we'll look at is incineration. And what I'm always going to do is I'm going to put the pros here in green and I'll put the cons over here in red. So what are the good things and the bad things about burning your trash? Well, what we can do is we can say, you know, burn uh, municipal solid waste or burning maybe hazardous or clinical waste. When we do that, we can actually use that to generate electricity. Burning municipal solid waste actually means that you can actually heat water to create steam and steam can create, uh, can move a turbine and create electricity. So that's one pro is we actually can burn our waste and make electricity. Burning your waste actually reduces the volume of the waste, not by 100%, but by 90 to 95% you're going to make ash or there will be some things that won't burn. So there will be a little bit of waste, but you certainly can reduce the amount of stuff that goes to the landfill by 90 or 95%. Now, those are the good things. Let's look at the bad things associated with burning trash. We definitely are going to create a lot of air pollution and sometimes very toxic residue. Burning trash, especially things like plastics or VOCs, creates a lot of greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and sulfur gases. And of course, that's not a good thing because that's, of course, going to lead to things like global warming. When we also burn our, our uh, trash, we create particulates, right, that kind of toxic residue, and a lot of that residue will have heavy metals in it, things like cadmium, mercury, and lead. Plastics that uh, will burn can also yield things like chlorine gas. Um, uh, there's also acids that you can make, hydrochloric acid or hydrogen cyanide. These are some pretty nasty chemicals that can be made by burning plastics. So now you've taken a relatively inert object, right, a plastic bag or something like that, and now you've created some very harmful gases as well as liquids the um, hydrochloric acid and the hydrogen cyanide. So what do you now do with those wastes? There is also stuff that will not burn that's relatively toxic. And so what do we do with that stuff? Um, the expense of burning trash, and there's also tons and tons of federal laws, right? Regulations on what can be burned and what cannot be burned, mainly because of all the stuff here we certainly don't want to burn plastic. You certainly don't. Um, in fact, actually, my neighbor does this often. He will collect uh, electrical wire and he will put it in a 50-gallon um, metal drum and he will burn the wire to try to get the plastic coating off of it so he can recycle the wire. Problem with that is that the smell that comes off of that burning plastic, first of all, is horrendous. And the toxic chemicals that are in that burning plastic are very, very uh, bad for you. Uh, yes, he is uh, upwind of me. And so whenever he does that, I try to stay inside. It's, it's highly illegal to do this, by the way. Um, you certainly don't want to be burning plastics. Um, so uh, definitely something that you don't want to do. And it does produce some pretty nasty chemicals. So, okay, so incineration has its good and has its bad. Um, another solution that people used to say, okay, what should we do with our trash to reduce the amount of stuff that's going into landfills? Well, we should just dump it in the oceans. And in 1981, the Environmental Protection Agency thought ocean dumping was a promising solution to the waste problem. Uh, I can tell you, I grew up in New Jersey. 
and there were many, many days when we were at the beach, and this is the view that we would see right here. You would see barges just offshore, and I'm not kidding, you could see them. That's how close they were to the shore. They would haul these barges filled with municipal solid waste just a couple miles offshore, and they would dump the barge into the ocean. It's a cheap solution, absolutely. You don't even have to worry about it, right? You just out of sight, out of mind, you dump it into the oceans. It removes the waste from the population, sure. Again, you just collect it, you put it on a barge and it goes away. You're not burning it, so there's no emissions, there's no ash, there's no nothing. Ocean dumping by 1990s was uh, significantly phased out. And the reason for that was because of all of the bad things associated with it. And I know that you guys know all about this, right? First of all, it dirtied up the water, uh, right? So the turbidity, right? The actual kind of cloudiness and the, the quality of the water was horrible. We would get solids washed up on our beaches all the time. In fact, we would go to the beach many days and there would be what we used to call a red flag warning. And a red flag warning, uh, warning meant that there was um, either trash actively washing up on the beach that day, or there was so much trash in the water that the algae in the water were blooming and that there was either an algae or a bacteria bloom that was bad enough that if you went swimming, you would probably get very, very sick. So solid waste washing up on the beaches, uh, we would all often see medical waste, hypodermic needles, all sorts of stuff. We would see that on the beaches. Uh, lots of other contaminants, of course, from all that waste. Bacteria would go crazy uh, with, with a lot of that waste and therefore make the water completely un, unusable. And then, of course, you also know, too, the ongoing ecosystem impact, right? Here's a seagull with tons of plastic in its stomach. Um, when I was a kid, actually, uh, my, and I still do it, and my husband, uh, you know, chuckles at me because uh, I still do it now, even though we still don't ocean dump anymore, but um, six-pack uh, uh, containers like this, right? I always used to cut the holes in them. I'd always cut the holes so that uh, no sea turtles or anything like that would actually ever get any plastic around them. One of the big issues right now with trash in the oceans, of course, is uh, sea turtles because a lot of plastics tend to look like the sea turtles' favorite food, which is jellyfish. And so a lot of sea turtles are ingesting plastics because they can't tell the difference. Their eyesight is very poor and uh, they can't tell the difference between plastic and a jellyfish. And so lots of sea turtles are actually meeting their demise by eating plastic by accident. So ocean dumping in the 80s was very popular, but by the 1990s, it was already phased out because we were seeing a lot of the negatives associated with that. We're actually still feeling the, the, the um, negative impacts of ocean dumping. And you may have heard of this, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Uh, in the Pacific Ocean, there is a massive, multiple country-sized uh, garbage patch of mostly plastics and microplastics um, and it has it's kind of collecting in the Pacific Ocean because the water in the Pacific Ocean is just kind of caught in one of these gyres that we talked about in our previous lecture and uh, the Great Pacific garbage patch is, is pretty massive it's visible from space um, and it is caused because Lots of things that have been making it into the ocean uh, are essentially are not breaking down very fast. If you look down here, here's the decomposition rates of some things that are making it into the ocean. Banana peels take two to three weeks, paper five to 10 weeks, a cigarette butt 10 to 15 years. A glass bottle takes over a million years to actually decompose. And then of course, things like styrofoam, plastic, um, and you know, plastic that's not biodegradable does not break down. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that plastics don't break down uh, by biodegradation, but they do break down in sunlight. They are photodegradable, but they don't break down into something that goes away completely. They break down into something called microplastics. And so the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is actually a ton of microplastic. This is what those microplastics look like, right? It's just smaller and smaller bits of um, photodegraded uh, plastic material. Uh, and if you want, by the way, there's a cool link back here about the uh, Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Here's the U.S., right? Here's the Pacific Ocean. 
Here's the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. By the way, here's how big France, Germany, and Spain are. Notice that the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is bigger than those three countries. It's certainly concentrated in some regions and more diffuse in others, but it is absolutely massive. So this is caught in that um, Pacific gyre here, and it is a surface floating mass of just municipal solid waste sitting in the Pacific Ocean. Here's some of the other uh, decomposition rates of stuff that once it gets into the ocean. Now, uh, some of those decomposition rates that I read to you earlier have actually been updated now. Um, and so notice that here, cigarette butt, one to five years, aluminum can, 200 years, glass, right? Undetermined, up to a million years, maybe. Plastic bottles, 450 years. Uh, let's see, where's my diapers? Yeah, diapers are the hugest thing right now in landfills, right? 450 years. Uh, styrofoam, 50 years. Uh, apple core, even two months. So um, lots of stuff here that takes a long time, even once it's in the ocean, before it actually starts to break down. So notice that plastic, you know, 400 to 500 years uh, before that starts to really break down, uh, it's going to be sticking around in our um, Great Pacific Garbage Patch file. I don't know if you guys know this guy. Uh, his name is Boyan Slot. And if you don't know who he is, and if you're a social media person, uh, check him out on Twitter, check him out on uh, Instagram or whatever. Um, he created this idea at age 16, by the way. In this, in this picture, he was 16 years old. He's not anymore. But he decided that he wanted to come up with a way that he could clean up the garbage in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And so what he created was this inflatable boom system. So he made this kind of V-shaped inflatable boom, and there is a natural siphon action that happens right at the V part. And so water, uh, so kind of, you know, currents and ocean currents with their trash or whatever, get caught in his V-shaped system here. The trash kind of gets pushed towards the middle part of the V as the water gets sucked down into the V part, and the trash eventually gets caught, and he can actually float out every day on his boat, and he can collect all of the trash that gets caught in his floating boom system. Pretty great. In fact, when he was 16 years old, he literally came up with this idea and uh, started a GoFundMe page and whatever else and got enough backing to do it. So here's what the first prototype looked like, right? Here's his floating booms and they're all connected and they're pushing the waste right towards the middle of the V. And remember too, what always happens when you ask the internet to name your invention, right? He asked the internet, what do you want to name uh, my new invention? And they came up with Boomy McBoomface. Well, that's what happens when you ask the internet to name your invention. But the coolest thing about following Boyan on uh, uh, Twitter and Instagram is that he has now put out his uh, version 2.0 system and it is working beautifully. So, um, there's some people doing some really great stuff out there trying to clean up floating municipal solid waste all over the world. And his boom system seems to be working very, very well. Okay, so incineration was number one. It's got a lot of uh, problems. We decided that we were going to try ocean dumping, some major problems associated with that as well. And so we have actually come up with this other idea here too, is well, maybe we could actually start to try to um, reopen old landfills. Maybe we could just reopen some of the old landfills and see if maybe that would be a way that we could deal with some of our um, municipal waste. Um, we could sell anything that is recyclable. We could actually maybe burn some of the waste that is in the, um, the old landfills or whatever. Maybe we can kind of take out the recyclables, get them out of those old landfills, burn some of the municipal waste, the ones that's safe, of course. And then we could, of course, then maybe use that space to then say, okay, well, we could put some other stuff back in that same landfill. Okay, there's problems with that also. Opening up old landfills is extremely dangerous. Uh, when waste decomposes, as you can imagine, right, when waste decomposes, it starts to collapse, okay? It starts to shrink, and the land surface above it is going to start to sink. So there is a big risk of um, the actual parts of the landfill collapsing. And if you've got heavy machinery and stuff on it, 
you certainly have the risk of collapsing certain parts of the old landfill. You also write on these old landfills that weren't built up to today's standard, you could release tons of methane gas or hazardous materials. Uh, that is a big problem, right? Because the methane gas and other gases associated with that could be not only toxic, but also um, uh, flammable. Um, and then too, if you open up these old landfills, it's ex very expensive to try to upgrade them so that they fit with today's landfill standards. Remember I showed you those old open dumps. Could you imagine trying to upgrade an old open dump to make it so that it fits the new sanitary landfill guidelines? It's actually very expensive and very difficult. So uh, again, possible, uh, but certainly has some significant uh, negatives associated with it. Number four, what is another response to landfill shortages? What could we do? Why don't we make regional landfills that support multiple areas and then have everybody kind of ship all of their trash into this regional lands, uh, landfill so that not every little town has to deal with their municipal waste. Instead, we kind of you know find a big broad area where several locations can ship all of their trash. Now, this does happen quite often, and about 10% of all municipal solid waste is transported across state lines. That's not a whole lot, but about 10%. Um, and you do have to pay for it. So Watauga County pays about $20 a ton, and it ships about 200 to 300 tons of municipal solid waste to Tennessee every day in the summertime. This is not when students are here, but this is in the summer. So, you know, why would you want to do this? Like, why does Tennessee want to take uh, Boone's waste? Well, if you think about it, it actually does. It creates jobs, right? Uh, landfills also mean that you can actually reduce property taxes. So those people that are around the landfill have less uh, expensive property tax. Um, if Boone is paying to ship its trash to Tennessee, that money that the Boone pays is actually earning money for the municipalities to pay for things like, you know, public safety, schools, uh, roads, whatever else. And what's great about having a landfill is that once the landfill is full and is closed, that county gets to keep the land. And so they can repurpose it for something like we talked about earlier, like a park or a golf course or something like that. There, of course, are negatives associated with this, right? Uh, if you're going to constantly be having these huge trucks bringing in trash to your regional landfill and it's on your land, it will take a heavy toll on your infrastructure, right? Your roads, your bridges, whatever else. Um, and of course, too, if you are the town that is that is shipping your trash, it's going to cost you money to get rid of it to send it someplace else. So there are some negatives here, but believe it or not, this happens quite often. Lots of states ship their trash to other regional landfills. Um, it does have a, a huge uh, toll on the infrastructure, um, but uh, it actually is certainly worth it for some uh, localities to do this, especially localities like Boone, where there is um, uh, high uh, mountainous regions, lots of slopes, and it's very difficult for us, of course, to then build landfills. Okay, what can you do at the individual level to reduce uh, the amount of solid waste that you produce every day? One thing you can do, of course, is to compost. Okay, T remember 24% of municipal solid waste is food or yard waste. And so what you can do is you can actually learn how to uh, combine certain types of waste materials so that they break down naturally. And they also then can create um, a lot of um, healthy organic material that you can use as mulch. So what you tend to do to make a compost heap, right, is you actually separate, you've got your browns and you've got your greens, okay? So you need to separate your browns to produce carbon and your greens to produce nitrogen. And you can have them covered or you can have them open, right, because you're actually gonna wanna get water and acids and all that sort of stuff to, to fall on your compost heap. But if you separate your brown materials and your green materials, you will create a bunch of nitrogen and a bunch of carbon that will then make very healthy topsoil that you can actually now put onto uh, you know, your yard or your lawn or your uh, vegetable garden and will actually help those grow. This also then reduces the amount of food waste that you put in your trash can. 
And so it reduces the amount of waste that will then have to go to the landfill. You also can recycle, right? And so recycling definitely takes solid waste out of your trash can. Um, and, you know, school, Boone has this, you know, uh, almost all places uh, around Boone uh, are now having recycling, whether it's required or voluntary. But you can take out your compostables, right? You can remove that stuff first. But then, of course, you can now recycle things like plastics, certain aluminums and metals, right? We do paper, cardboard, um, glass, all sorts of things. And don't forget, too, you can also then recycle any plastic bags that you might have. Many supermarkets are now uh, accepting plastic bags where you can recycle those, keeping them out of your municipal solid waste. Recycling, of course, saves energy as well, right? If we then recycle, that means that we burn fewer fossil fuels to make a lot of those plastics or a lot of those metals. Um, because uh, then if you're recycling the metal, recycling the plastic, then you don't have to burn as much fossil fuel to make that, um, that same amount of raw material. If we burn less fossil fuels, then of course that reduces the CO2 in the atmosphere and decreasing CO2 means that we decrease greenhouse gases and we affect climate change that, well, that way. So certainly important to remember that recycling not only saves energy, but it also then saves us from burning as much fossil fuels to make the raw materials. In 2012, uh, the average Americans were recycling and composting about 87 million tons of trash. So in 2012, we were recycling about, you know, 35% of our municipal solid waste. So about one and a half pounds of recyclable material per person per day. So, you know, we're actually doing better, right? The amount of stuff that we are recycling is going up. And what that means is that the amount that we are discarding and therefore going into our, um, our uh, landfills is certainly going down. This is all a good thing. Other uh, countries are doing some really great efforts, right? For example, um, the UK is actually taxing the use of plastic bags. It's a seven cent charge. Uh, certain states in the U.S. are now doing this as well. I think California does this already. Um, India has just put out a ban on all single-use plastics by the year 2022. Uh, the European Union has already banned some single-use plastics and by 2025 wants to reduce um, its single-use plastic bottles uh, as well as recycle up to 90% of any single-use plastic bottles that are still in uh, circulation. These are two hashtags, of course, that are now going on Twitter and on Instagram, um, and you can actually use these about what do you do to reduce the amount of material that you put in your trash. Um, and here's here's mine, right? Uh, I, I always use my uh, my recyclable metal coffee mug, and I you often see me in during lab too. I've got my uh, recyclable water bottle. And of course, you know, if you want to beat plastic pollution, these are really important. I think this was a, an image that came out in National Geographic, I think, two years ago. This little seahorse attached to a plastic sticked Q-tip. Um, and so reminding us that, you know, lots of the stuff that we use is still making it into the oceans. And remember, it's making it into the oceans not because of ocean dumping, but because of um, open um, trash and open uh, landfills and uh, things are actually getting into the rivers naturally, right? Uh, trash and whatever is getting into the rivers, those rivers are emptying into the oceans and bringing a lot of that solid waste. There are many countries actually that are still using river systems uh, to dump trash. And of course, that stuff is eventually making it right into the oceans. Um, remember we said too, of the municipal solid waste of the, you know, the other municipal solid waste, right? 2% um, of that 3% of other waste is e-waste. Um, this is electronic waste. This is uh, cell phones. This is uh, all sorts of stuff that uh, computer screens, tablets, TVs, flat screens, whatever else. Um, and a lot of it actually is usable or whole electronic equipment. I mean, how many of you guys do the new every two where you get a brand new cell phone every two years, whether there's anything wrong with your old one or not? Uh, I do it. I'm guilty of it. And in fact, on campus, they upgrade my computer every two years or they want to. And I keep saying, no, 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 I'm good. It's still fine. I'm still using it. It's doing great. So um, 
A large portion of e-waste is actually still usable whole electronic equipment, but it's being uh, thrown out and only about 12 and a half percent of it is being recycled. If we recycled about 1 million laptops, that would be saving enough energy to run almost 4,000 US homes in a year. Um, so that's a lot of energy that, that we're wasting right there. And you'll notice that we're, we are learning how to recycle e-waste a little bit better as time goes on. But of course, at only about 12 and a half percent, we definitely need to be better at recycling e-waste. This is what I mean by e-waste. Uh, it actually is um, prohibited to ship e-waste internationally. So it is illegal for the US to ship its e-waste to, for example, you know, China or whatever else, but we still do it. In fact, there's a 60 Minutes program where they actually watched a, um, a community do a recycling, com computer recycling pickup. They loaded all of the computers into a um, tractor and trailer, uh, what do you call it? I don't know, the, 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 the container. They, uh, they locked it and they actually now, they marked the container identification number and then they followed it and found that it actually did end up in a dump very much like this in China, despite the fact that it is illegal to do it. There were a lot of middlemen, right? It got sold to this person and then sold to that person and then that person sold it to China. But it is illegal to do that. Um, and the reason for that is because of all the toxic material that is coming out of e-waste. Chromium-6, mercury, beryllium, cadmium, lead, and of course, a lot of the folks that are now working in these um, e-waste landfills are going in and trying to pull out a lot of the precious waste, the precious metals, right? Platinum, palladium, whatever else. And they're burning plastics. And of course, a lot of them are women. A lot of them are children. Um, and this is extremely, extremely bad for anybody in that area. You cannot breathe this stuff. You shouldn't be touching this stuff. Um, and unfortunately, it is quite popular in some underdeveloped countries. 2% of landfill waste is e-waste, but e-waste makes up more than 70% of the toxic waste that we produce. Americans throw away over $60 million in gold and silver in e-waste every year. You have gold and, and um, platinum and other precious metals in your cell phone. And so by just you know throwing away your cell phone and not recycling it or whatever else, you're throwing away all of that precious metal. It takes 530 pounds of fossil fuel, 48 pounds of chemicals, and one and a half tons of water to produce one computer and one monitor. That's a lot of stuff, right, to make one computer. And so by recycling the materials that are in computers, it certainly would help to not use as much fossil fuels, not use as much chemicals, and certainly reduce our water usage as well. The exposure to e-waste uh, is, is, is pretty devastating. Um, like I said, a lot of the folks that are in um, these e-waste landfill situations are being exposed to some pretty heavy duty chemicals, right? Um, polyvinyl chloride, things like mercury, arsenic, cadmium. And if you want to, you can read through all here that tells you about all the different types of vital um, life systems that these things attack you know, from kidneys to um, creating a nervous system damage, um, a lot of uh, renal failure, all sorts of stuff associated with this. And again, this is mostly women and children who are actually working in these, um, these uh, e-waste recycling systems. So there's actually another type of solid waste that you make in your household every day, but it's not municipal solid waste, it's uh, human waste, it's sewage. And I think, I think many of the places in Boone are actually going to have uh, their sewage systems uh, linked to a sewer system uh, that is uh, run by the town of Boone, because I know that there's a water treatment plant, <clears throat> excuse me, in Boone. And uh, what that means is that any waste that is in your home, whether it is from the toilet, from your shower, or anything like that, uh, could even be wastewater from your sink, or from your um, dishwasher, 
will actually then get into a, a plumbing system, leave your house, and then get into a um, city regulated sewer system where it then goes to a water treatment plant. Now, if you are not within city limits, my guess is the way that your household treats solid human waste is using a septic tank. So where I live here out in rural Wilkes County, we have a septic system. And so what that means is that the waste drains of the house, so the bathrooms, the showers, the whatever else, leave the house and then all drain into essentially a septic tank. So in our, <clears throat> excuse me, in our uh, backyard, we have a buried septic tank. The idea is that the, the waste from your, you know, the bathrooms, the showers, the whatever else goes into your uh, uh, septic tank and it's a two part system. The first part here where the water actually comes in, the solid waste actually sinks and collects here. So the solid waste collects there and they're hopefully trying to collect as much of the solid there. And if not, if any of the solid waste makes it into the second chamber of the septic tank, the solid waste, because it's larger and heavier, will usually sink at the bottom of the septic tanks. So the solid waste settles. <clears throat> and in your septic tanks, usually what you are using is uh, aerobic microorganisms. So if you have a septic tank, you have probably put in a box of RIDX or something like that. It essentially seeds the septic tank with the right bacteria to help break down the organics both in the settling tanks, right, phase one and phase two over here, as well as in the, um, the, the leach field or the drain field, which I'm going to talk about next. So the organisms that are in your septic tank help to kind of, you know, break down the solids, but any of the liquid that is in your septic tank, right, so the solids are going to settle out, but the, li the liquid that's in your septic tank gets pumped out into what's called a drain field or a leach field. This is a set of um, multiple long uh, porous pipes that leave from your septic tank and are buried underground somewhere in your yard. And this is where the uh, liquid waste from the septic tank gets pumped out into the drain field. And what happens there is that the bacteria, you know, are still doing their thing, right? They're still kind of working on breaking down the organics that are in the liquid waste in your drain field but then it slowly um, lets the effluent, right, the actual liquid waste, it slowly lets the liquid waste out into the soil. And the idea here is that a, the soil microorganisms and the, the filtration action of the, the liquid waste going through the soil kind of cleans it uh, and filters it so that if any of the liquid waste eventually does make it down into the groundwater, it's essentially right been cleaned. And of course, then, you know, the groundwater slowly moves and can come back into, you know, the, the, the hydrologic cycle somewhere else, you know, later on down the line. And so this is a, a, a home level septic system. Um, and it's, you know, so it's one septic tank per, you know, multiple bedroom home or something like that. And you have to constantly reseed this because if you clean your bathrooms with, say, bleach products or whatever else, and that gets into the water that goes into your septic tank, you can kill some of the good bacteria. So that's why it's a good idea every month or every couple of months, you know, put in a box of that Ridex stuff so that <clears throat> you can um, put the good bacteria back into your septic system. Now, of course, you know, the, the microorganisms can't break down all of the solids. And so every, you know, decade or every 15 years, you may have to have a septic tank pumped to remove the solid waste because they will fill up over time. Um, when you build a home, it is very important that when you have your home site evaluated for your uh, house building or whatever else, they are going to have to check at whether you, the soil around your house has a good permeability. And so what they will do is called a perk test. They are essentially measuring the ability of the soil to percolate fluids. So that's why it's called a perk test. So a, a drain field has to have a drain field, right? Or a leach field has to have a good permeability. 
the way that we actually then look at that is to look at the type of soil, right? Remember that the better the permeability, usually the coarser the grain size, right? So really big things like gravels and sand are going to have a better porosity and permeability than things like clay or sandy clay, okay? Those are gonna be much finer grained and so they're gonna have a smaller porosity and a smaller permeability. Therefore, it makes sense that depending on um, the, the type of gravel, excuse me, the type of soil that you have, the number of square meters of, le of drain field or leach field that you need per bedroom in your home actually gets higher the finer your grain size is because you don't have as much permeability, right? If you have really coarse gravelly soil, you only need about six and a half square meters per bedroom of your house. But if you have a clay soil with only minor sand or gravel in it, you need up to 23 square meters of drain field per bedroom in your home. So uh, really important to know kind of whether your soil will perk and what its perk level is before you then build uh, and put in a septic system. Certainly important that you have a very deep water table. You don't want your uh, drain field putting your effluent right into the groundwater. You definitely need to have a good soil package before that uh, liquid waste makes it back into the groundwater. And you wanna have a thick soil cover, right? You don't wanna be directly on top of bedrock. You wanna have a thick soil package so that you are able then to let the effluent, the liquid waste, right, flow through the soil, get filtered, and then get kind of cleaned by the bacteria and microorganisms, the good bacteria and the good microorganisms that are in the soil. You absolutely want your septic system to be away from any surface waters, right? You don't want it to be near any sort of like rivers or creeks or anything like that. And it certainly shouldn't have any contact with any of your drinking water wells. <clears throat> certainly a big problem, right? Because if you're going to pump groundwater for your drinking water well, and you happen to get contamination from your septic system into the groundwater, you're going to have a very big problem with your home water supply being uh, contaminated by uh, sewage. So a municipal solid, uh, excuse me, a municipal sewage treatment plant kind of works at the same level as a home septic system, but just on a much bigger scale. So in densely populated areas, septic systems can't be used. And so sewage is kind of treated by the municipality on a much larger level, but it does kind of have the same principles as a home septic system. In many countries though, for example, notice that this picture was taken in the Philippines, um, 90 up to, depending on the country, up to 90% of sewage is discharged directly into surface water, into rivers. And so look, you know, this idea of taking and collecting municipal sewage and treating it in a large regional uh, treatment plant is really only practiced in certain industrialized countries. In many developing countries, there is no way to deal with municipal sewage and instead up to 90% is discharged directly into surface waters. Lots of people use that surface water for bathing, for um, cleaning uh, clothes and whatever else. And so there's a lot of problems with um, disease transmittance and whatever else, cholera and whatever else, um, because of the contamination of the surface water by human sewage. In places though where you do have a municipal sewage treatment plant, so where you're able to literally send all of your waste not into a home septic system, but into the local sewer system, the sewer system then collects everybody's sewage uh, waste and sends it to the treatment plant. The first thing that happens is at the primary stage, right, that's up here, this is the primary stage, all of that stuff first of all goes through a screen, right, to hopefully collect as much of the solids as possible and then it goes into a grit chamber. Again, very similar to a septic system, it's essentially just a big deep hole, and so the solids should hopefully start to settle, and the liquids keep moving through the system. You then get into the next part here, the primary sedimentation tank, and it's just finer grained material that didn't settle out in the grit chamber is now gonna try to settle out here in the sedimentation tank. 
all this, right, all this stuff over here, this is the primary phase of municipal sewage treatment. In the secondary stage now, we're going to use biology and we're actually going to like kind of react the liquid waste with things like uh, microorganisms. Um, we're going to bubble things like oxygen and whatever else through the liquid waste and allow the microorganisms and the oxygen to try to break down a lot of the stuff that's in the liquid. The, um, the aeration tank is where we're pumping in all the air. That's where the microorganisms are going to be doing their thing. We pump all that stuff into a final settling tank so that in case the microorganisms have now reacted with anything in the water and made a solid, we're now going to let all that solids kind of sludge sink to the bottom. And if there are solids, we're going to pump that solid sludge out and it's either composted incinerated or used as a nutrient for things like soils. Now, the other thing in the secondary stage here too, what can often happen is this is where you will have UV treatment, right? So ultraviolet radiation to kill any sort of microorganisms that are still left in the water. And if you are in an area where they actually have a tertiary stage, right? you actually can continue through the system over here. This is your tertiary stage. Oh, I forgot. Um, still in the secondary stage after the UV treatment, this is where you get the um, chlorine treatment, right? You're gonna take out chlorine uh, and you're, sorry, you're gonna put in chlorine and you're gonna disinfect the water using chlorine. Uh, many, many, many uh, municipalities stop here. Okay, and then this is the water that then gets pumped back to your uh, home faucet. Some, however, some uh, municipal sewage treatment plants actually will have a tertiary system here where they will have an ultrafine filtration system before the water actually then gets back out into the municipal water supply. We're using the same principles as a septic tank, right? Where we do settling here and then we actually do uh, treatment of the liquids over here, but we're just doing it in a more of a kind of larger scale um, way to, to kind of, uh, and then using also <clears throat> chemicals and UV light and microorganisms to try to break down some of the solid waste. Okay, so that's how we deal with municipal waste and solid human waste and liquid human waste. How do we deal with radioactive waste? Um, it depends on what kind it is. So radioactive waste, of course, is stuff that is giving off radioactivity, right? And there are three different types. There's low level, intermediate, and high level. Low level radioactive waste is stuff like, you know, medical waste, right? Filters, rags, liquids that might have something on it that is giving off radioactivity. 90% of radioactive waste is uh, this low level radioactive waste. The way that we deal with this in terms of disposal is that we temporarily store it right until the radioactivity has decreased and then we send it off to the landfill the idea here is that you wait until the radioactivity is no longer a problem and then you send the inert material right the stuff that is no longer radioactive you send it to the landfill now there is something called uh, intermediate radioactive waste right it's about nine percent of the radioactive waste that we have and so this is stuff like defense waste or you know spent fuel rods or whatever else from nuclear uh, energy production and the way that we deal with that is through subsurface burial uh, we essentially bury it either deep in the ground or uh, we've actually hollowed out mountains and we bury that intermediate waste in the ground so that it is now protected from people, from water, from air, from whatever else uh, for the long amount of time that is needed before its radioactivity has decreased to safe levels. Now, there is such a thing as high level radioactive waste. Okay, it's, there's not a lot of it, but there is high level radioactive waste and the EPA has mandated that high level radioactive waste must be isolated from the human population for at least 1 million years. 1 million years. Where do we put that? What do you think? Where do we put that stuff? Well, let's talk about kind of where we put all of this radioactive waste. Radioactive waste 
contains isotopes that um, break down into some other either stable or unstable type of isotope. And so whatever does the breaking down is called the parent isotope, okay? So the parent radioactive isotope may break down and uh, by, by literally making changes in the atomic nucleus. When the parent isotope breaks down into the daughter isotope by changing the nucleus, often what is given off during that process of breakdown is radioactive um, uh, radiation. So it could be gamma radiation, beta radiation, there's a bunch of different types, but um, the process of, of an isotope breaking down from parent into daughter is, uh, is the way that we produce radioactivity. Many, many different isotopes break down um, and have radioactive decay. Um, uranium, um, rubidium, uh, carbon-14, a bunch of them. Um, and not all of it is harmful, but some of it is. And um, many of them break down in extremely short periods of time. Uh, could be, you know, minutes to seconds. Some of them break down in time periods that are extremely long on the order of billions or even trillions of years. So scientists came up with this idea of a half-life. Um, rather than talking about how long it takes for an isotope, all of the isotope to decay from parent into daughter, they came up with the concept of half-life. The half-life is the time it takes for half of the parent isotope to decay to its daughter product, okay? So it's literally the time it takes for 100% parent to break down into 50% parent and 50% daughter, okay? So uh, if we were gonna talk about half-lives then, this is what we would actually do, rather than drawing it out like I did here, and I'm gonna erase this for you right here, the half-life essentially, if you look at the red line on this graph, okay, this is the number of parent and daughter isotopes, and so the parent is in red, the daughter is in blue. When zero half-lives have gone by, all of your isotope is 100% parent. But after one half-life has gone by, notice now you have 50% parent and 50% daughter. The way you figure out how to do this is that if at time equals zero, right, if you start at time equals zero, you have 100% parent, zero daughter. Now, after one half-life, all you have to do is take the parent, divide it by two, and add the remainder to the daughter. Okay? So now, after two half-lives, Right, we can keep doing it again. If time equals two, we just divide the parent. Now, you don't go back to the beginning. Divide the parent by two and add the remainder to the daughter. Right, and so on and so forth. So now notice, look, this is 75%, that's 25%. And you could keep doing it and so on and so forth. So uh, the half-life then is every time you divide by two, that is one half-life right? We divided by two, that's another half-life. Many of these um, highly radioactive elements needed to be, and still should be, um, kept away from the human population for extremely long periods of time because their half-lives, the amount of time it takes for the parent to break down into a more stable daughter is on the order of the age of the earth, right? So, you know, 4.3 billion years. So many of the um, products <clears throat> from nuclear reactors fit into this category of intermediate to high level nuclear waste that needs to be sequestered, okay? Kept away from the human population for long periods of time. Um, when the disposal plan goes horribly wrong with this radioactive waste, 
we get um, horrendous disasters very similar to like the Chernobyl disaster in Ukraine or um, Three Mile Island uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, and if you haven't seen all of the recent movies that have come out on Netflix and whatever else uh, about the Chernobyl disaster, um, I highly recommend. Uh, it, it is absolutely amazing uh, what happened, what didn't happen, what should have happened. Um, during the Chernobyl reactor. Um, to give you a brief timeline, uh, April 25th, 1986, uh, several workers were at reactor number four at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine, and they actually were trying to do a routine safety inspection. What they did is they actually shut down reactor number four for routine maintenance. At around 1.23 in the morning on April 26th, a drop in the power triggered a chain reaction in the nuclear reactor that essentially caused the reactor to overheat. The overheating of the reactor caused reactor number four to explode. Radioactive smoke, ash, and just radiation in general shot 100 kilometers into the air and eventually started to spread as air currents took it, a plume actually started to kind of um, emanate from the Chernobyl plant. Between April 26th and May 5th, they tried to drop tons of sand and clay and lead onto the reactor. They tried to put out the fires um, but imagine any workmen that are coming into the area to try to do any fight, firefighting or whatever else are all being exposed to this high level radiation. Uh, in the spring and summer of 86, uh, they evacuated the people around Chernobyl. Uh, literally, the, the population around the power plant had to be uh, 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 um, re -evac evacuated and, and moved somewhere else. And then in November, they tried to build a temporary shelter, almost like a like a coffin over the top of the building in order to contain 200 tons of this, you know, kind of melting nuclear fuel. The problem is, is that actually they started to notice in about 1997, I'm over here, right, that the um, the, the shelter that they built over reactor number four had started to leak extremely badly. And so they've actually started a new, they're calling it the sarcophagus project. Um, and it has actually recently been finished and been slid into place over top of reactor four. And if you look at the, the graphic over here, what they actually did is it took them a little bit longer, right? They were hoping to finish it in 2013. And it actually was finished in 2016. This is what the old reactor looked like. And here's the emergency cover, right? What they did is built a massive, huge, permanent um, coffin, right? And what they did is they put it on rollers. And they so they built it and then literally on, on rails, slid it over reactor number four to try to keep uh, the radiation from getting into the environment. Total cost for the project, 2.1 billion euros, but at least it is in operation and it's keeping the um, radiation from the Chernobyl plant, which is still extremely radioactive uh, from getting out into the neighboring environment. So, you know, what would you do with high level radioactive waste um, there? You know, if we can't put them in these um, facilities, like if they're going to leak or break down or whatever else, it, it's a big problem. So what do we do? There have been lots of uh, suggestions, some of which are good, some of which I'm pretty sure uh, are not are not serious. Maybe they're being comical. I'm not sure. Um, but a lot of people have suggested, why don't we shoot it into outer space? Right. OK, cool. That's great. Let's put essentially uh, a nuclear bomb out into space. Um, but the idea is keeping it away from people. OK, I understand that. Um, other suggestions have been, why don't we put it on the deep sea floor? Right. It's cold. It's isolated. We could put it on the deep sea floor. Uh, many people suggest that they, we put it in caves and we use those caves to isolate it from the human population. Important to remember, though, how caves form, right? Caves form by the dissolution of, uh, of rock in the subsurface, usually because of the interaction between water and rock. And so maybe caves, not such a good idea, right? Because obviously there's water flowing through them. 
Uh, there's actually been a suggestion, maybe we should put it under the Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, maybe not such a great idea with uh, climate change and global warming, right? Um, some folks have said, why don't we put it in some of our deep sea trenches and let it get resubducted into Earth's core, uh, or Earth's mantle rather, um, at subduction zones. Um, and a lot of other people have said, and actually this is the one that's gaining quite a bit of um, traction these days, find uh, impermeable igneous rock um, depositories underground and store it there. Um, and then we could also liquefy it and then just rocket it to the sun. Sure, there's no there's no issue with money or anything like that with that one. Um, so, you know, none of these are without their their um, their negatives. And of course, a lot of these are highly expensive. But um, one thing that's gaining traction is this idea here of impermeable igneous rock depositories. And uh, the idea of kind of can we find places where bedrock is relatively impermeable, right, using igneous rocks because they have a very low permeability, and then um, boring into that type of bedrock and surrounding that with a multi-barrier concept, right? So not only finding bedrock that is impermeable, but then surrounding the high level waste that you put into that rock with several different different types of materials that hopefully will help reduce the risk of leakage. The first thing, of course, that we would have to do is to figure out what sorts of bedrocks will be the most suitable for uh, disposing high level radioactive waste. We need low porosity and low permeability. OK, so anything with holes in it or anything with fractures in it is bad. It needs to be crystalline. Once again, igneous rocks doing very well, right? It can't have any fractures in it, right? So not good over here. No sedimentary rocks, right? And it has to be resistant to both chemical and physical weathering. What we're noticing right now is igneous rocks tend to be the best candidate for some of these bedrock disposal sites. They kind of fit the bill in terms of the rock types that would be most suitable. If we look at places around the US where there already is nuclear waste storage, the, um, the darker the color here, the amount, the larger the amount of uranium, radioactive re uranium being stored in those states. So Illinois, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina already storing quite a bit of the U.S.'s nuclear waste. And what they're storing at these locations is um, spent fuel rods from um, nuclear power. So you'll notice that, of course, some states have quite a bit of nuclear waste being stored. Um, and believe it or not, notice that there's not a lot being stored right out in this region. Well, there is actually, there was at one point actually a, a push to use one of the mountains out in Nevada called Yucca Mountain um, to store a lot of waste because of course there's not a huge population out in Nevada either. The Yucca Mountain Geologic Repository fit the bill really, really nicely. This is literally Yucca Mountain right here, okay? And uh, what, they, what geologists noticed is that, okay, igneous rocks are really good for storing nuclear waste. So the Yucca Mountain is made of uh, volcanic rock and it has a very low permeability. So, so far so good, right? We also notice that um, uh, Yucca Mountain, which by the way, like I said, is in Nevada, it's in a geologically stable area. There are you know, very small earthquakes that happen around the region, but the um, repository that, they're going, that they built at Yucca Mountain was designed to withstand a huge earthquake. And it's, that's really unlikely to happen here. Other things that are good about Yucca Mountain, right? There's not a lot of rainfall in the area, which means there's not a lot of surface water. The water table is very, very low, right? So there's really, there's low risk of contamination if there is any sort of spill of any sort of seepage of the um, nuclear waste, the water table is extremely low. It would have a long way to go. There's no surface streams, once again, right? No, no real worry about contaminating surface water. There is a low population density, so not a lot of people around, and the US government already owned the land around Yucca Mountain. So what you'll notice in this picture up here actually is here's all of the offices associated with Yucca Mountain. 
And then underground, there's a tunnel built all the way over into the mountain here. And then they've hollowed out Yucca Mountain here to store nuclear waste. If you look at it in cross section right here, here's Yucca Mountain, right? There's Yucca Mountain. And the idea here is that uh, it's made of igneous rock. You would essentially then bury all of the nuclear waste here in the uh, kind of core of the mountain. And, you know, you wouldn't have to worry so much about, uh, you know, any sort of contamination because the groundwater is very low, right? There's not a lot of fractures and material being moved through the subsurface. So Yucca Mountain was a, a pretty big idea for a long time. Um, the disposal plan was set up like this, right? Here's the processing site. Trains would actually bring in the waste like this, and the waste would already be kind of contained in these capsules. Then at the processing site, they would send the waste down a ramp and into these chambers beneath Yucca Mountain. And then uh, coming off this main chamber would be these arms, and these are where we would store all the radioactive waste, right? These little storage containers. The, uh, the multi-barrier concept that we decided to use for Yucca Mountain is that here's the fuel rods right on the inside. There's the actual waste. But then what they're uh, contained in, right, they're actually contained within waste packets. And then there's this big um, transportation, aging, and disposal canister, right, the TADS. Then there's also within the tunnels, right, there's actually protection around the tunnels. Uh, and then, of course, they're also now within the bedrock. So multi-barrier concepts there kind of trying to really uh, reduce the likelihood that if anything did uh, get outside of these contamination uh, rods, would they get into the local environment? And of course, the multi-barrier concept hopefully gives us the answer of no. Uh, several years ago, right, the Obama administration actually cut funding to Yucca Mountain after 20 years of building and $9 billion. They built the facility, but no waste was ever stored there. Congress actually just requested two years ago, um, the Trump administration, they asked for another $120 million to keep building Yucca Mountain, and Trump said no. So a frightening thought to think about here with Yucca Mountain is that it was designed, when Yucca Mountain was built, it was designed to hold 70,000 tons of radioactive waste. So Congress now already, and we've already accumulated that much, we have already accumulated enough radioactive waste to fill Yucca Mountain. And that's why Congress requested a second facility and it was denied. So where are we gonna put this waste? Yucca Mountain still has not actually held any waste even though it is built, um, but the, uh, we have already accumulated enough waste to fill Yucca Mountain and then some. Congress has now recommended that we build a second facility and that was not funded. So finding a suitable waste site and a waste situation for radioactive waste, extremely important um, and certainly uh, going to be interesting to watch over the next couple of years to see what we're going to do with this waste, especially as we start to, to make more and more as we get away from fossil fuels and start to learn uh, to use more things like nuclear energy.